Hi, I'm Jimmy K. Courtney. I'm a doctoral student in the Department of Health and Exercise Science. I am an honored, am an honored to be one of the VPR fellows, and it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Laura Malinin. She is an assistant professor and director of the Richardson Design Center here at Colorado State University. Dr. Malinin joined the Department of Design and Merchandising at CSU in 2013. Her research is at the intersection of environmental design and cognitive science, focusing on the role of the design environment from rooms to cities in human creativity and well-being. At the core of her research program, she considers design thinking from a transdisciplinary perspective by examining physically situated cognitive processes involved in design creativity, also known as psychospatial dynamics, from both process and place perspectives. She has published on topics ranging from theoretical models of creativity and perspective, perception, to place-based education and service learning. Her place-focused research considers the psychological, physiological, and sociological impacts of designed environments on creative resilience and includes school design, workplace design, and designs for healthy aging. Dr. Malinin was appointed to the director of the Richardson Design Center in January of 2018, and please join me in welcoming Dr. Malinin. Too far. There we go. Hello and good afternoon. Um, so this is a presentation in three parts. So it's essentially about my experience with virtual reality from the practice perspective, from research, and then finally from teaching. So from practice, I began my career as a licensed practicing architect. And when I began practicing, we weren't too far from removed from this. I think I might have been that young lady all the way off to the side there. Um, so we were all paper-based, right? I, everything was done by hand on paper. It was all drawings as a way that we communicated design ideas to each other and also to our clients. This is today. So we don't see a whole lot of difference, even though We've now moved to computer-based platforms. We're doing, using things like building information modeling to create three-dimensional models of our projects. Um, we're still outputting those models to 2D formats. So plans, sections, elevations, and then you know we'll do some models too at scale to help our clients understand their designs. And um, the problem with this is we're just too far removed, right? So we don't get feedback from our design until it's too late until the people move in. Um, so we can start to get you know, some idea of what we might experience in a built environment, but as a practicing uh, designer, I can tell you there wasn't a single project I designed that I didn't come into that space and go, oh, hmm, I didn't know it was gonna be like that. And you, know, you cross your fingers and you hope it's a good O, um, but it's not always a good O. Um, and this is, you know, of course, a beautiful example of a well-designed building. So with virtual reality then, where we're seeing firms start to move to in the adoption of virtual reality is really in testing their design ideas. And they're testing their design ideas pretty late mostly in the project. Uh, so in this case, we're looking at a group using uh, augmented reality, so the HoloLens, and they're looking at a virtual model. So what is the benefit of this over a physical model? Well, there are a few. Um, you can scale things up and down. Um, you can be a little more immersed in the model. You can change out options pretty quickly. Um, so there's some benefits over a paper-based model. But to really understand a space, you need to be immersed in it. And that's where I think virtual reality has a lot more power and potential in design. So we're, we, we still are mostly, firms are mostly still using this at the end of the design process so that the, to, sell a, to sell a design really to a client because it's expensive to do these kinds of models or it has been, but it's quickly changing. Um, so this is a good example of, uh, has anyone experienced the IKEA VR experience? Yeah, so um, this is a good example of the type of um, design process or design options you might see in VR. 
which is you might be able to change out the colors, change out the finishes, um, and maybe you can even change your perception and be a child again. Um, so if you haven't checked this out and you have access to VR, it's kind of fun because the interesting thing with this um, is the first version was kind of a bust. Um, it didn't go over well with people, and they were trying to figure out, so why, you know, why you can get in here, you can really see firsthand what your kitchen's gonna look like, and it was because it wasn't interactive enough, and they wanted the meatballs. So when they added the meatballs and some other things, um, then people became really engaged with this experience because it felt more real world, they can, you know, pretend, they can virtually make dinner, et cetera. Um, this is another company that's um, a new company that has kind of an interesting uh, product. They are trying to be the PDF of VR. So they're trying to take um, the model and export it in a seamless way into virtual reality and allow people then to annotate and tag and provide different options, much like you would with PDF. And then finally, I think the, the real limitation or a real limitation of why VR hasn't been adopted more widely in practice is that it's not yet really collaborative. Um, and design is highly collaborative. So you have architects and interior designers and engineers and construction professionals all working together. And so this is a company that's starting to look at that um, element of can we be in the space together virtually. So this is going to move, so now I'm going to move now a little bit to talk about research. So there is another trend in practice, which is research-informed design. And so a lot of the large firms like um, Gensler, um, HKS, are investing in research to help them understand how to design more effectively. And I think this is an area where VR really has a lot of potential um, because, uh, you know, Churchill kind of had it right. We design our environments, and then after we design them, they start to affect us. They impact our, the way we think. They impact the way we behave. So these are two research questions that guide much of my research. So how do architectural designs affect cognitive processes, and then how do people use features of their designed environments to help them solve complex and particularly creative problems? So one group that I've been working with is um, aging. So aging is, uh, is a problem when we're talking about people being able to stay in their homes. We know that the natural aging process involves a decline in all different kinds of cognitive processes, including executive functioning, which is important for people to live independently. And so for uh, my first pilot project that I did, as soon as I got my brand new HTC Vive, I had to try it out. I partnered with a neuroscientist and we were looking at this concept of environmental enrichment. So in the 1960s, some scientists discovered that mice in empty cages um, versus mice in enriched environments or cages that are physically, socially, mentally stimulating had different brain structures. And the brains of the mice in the enriched environments were much healthier, right? They were learning from their environment. And so we know that neurogenesis is something that goes on throughout the lifespan. And so this is a theory that a lot of architects are looking to to think about designs for healthy aging. And so we thought, OK, so what is environmental enrichment? When we're in the real world, we can't control a lot of things. But if we just start with something simple like visual complexity, how do we start to break that down? How do we start to measure it? Um, and then can, how do we control it in a virtual environment? So in our pilot, we, um, we looked mostly at legibility, which is the degree to which your interior designs, your furnishings, the accessories, um, the decorative elements suggest what you should be doing, so suggest activities. And then a little bit with texture, um, so adding a little variety in terms of color. And we used um, the Vive, and we tested out just this, these two simple room designs, and we tried to control on density as much as we could, and we just manipulated the texture a little bit, and we really tried to, to scale up the, the, uh, the legibility in the H uh, environment there. And then we put some people in the Vive, and we did some tests. And um, one thing that was really interesting is we found that um, the, uh, the degree of realism did not need to be a lot. 
So this is using SketchUp. It was a really quick and easy. We used a plugin. We just popped it right into VR. We didn't do a whole lot with it. And when we were testing this out with my students, one of them accidentally landed on the glass uh, coffee table and thought he was going to fall over. So he had his real visceral experience of, oh my gosh, I just, I'm standing on a glass coffee table. So we didn't let our participants do, do that uh, once we realized that teleporting was probably not a good idea. But we did come up with some um, interesting uh, results that suggest that, that cognitive performance was slightly improved. People were exploring the environment that was, um, had higher legibility longer, and they certainly felt more engaged. So talking really quickly about, um, Caden already touched on this, the B-sharp, C-sharp program. Uh, what I really think is interesting here is the ability to compare real and virtual environments. So there's always the argument that when you're doing experimental re research that it doesn't compare to the real world, that we have so many different factors in the real world. And so by being able to replicate an experience, real world and virtual, and then do some cognitive testings and other, and other data, we're able to start to compare those things and tease apart what might be causing some improvement, for example, in cognitive performance when people attend the symphony. And then the other, um, I think, really big um, affordance of virtual reality is our ability to test actual behaviors. So when we're designing cities for walkability, we typically have people look at pictures and say, would you walk here? And we all know that what we say and what we do are two different things. So by being able to untether virtual reality, we actually got the system out in the parking lot and we walked a long ways, <laughs> and we had the realism of real cars driving around us, um, to see what it felt like to just be able to walk virtually in, a, you know, in an environment, but also be having a one-to-one -one feel to be out in the outside while you're walking virtually in a virtual environment. And that allows us then, you know, in the future to start to use maybe mobile EEG and some other, you know, even Fitbits and things with those devices to better understand what's actually going on, why are people walking, how do we change design elements, what does that do to mood, what does that do to engagement, heart rate variability, et cetera. So now moving a little bit more towards the learning uh, sphere and creativity. Um, so this is uh, the human-centered design model. So you see there are five stages, empathize, so understand your users, define the problem or f often find the problem, right? You might think you know the problem and it turns out you don't. Ideate different options, prototype solutions, and then test with users. So I would argue that VR is mostly being used for five and a little bit for stage four. But what if we looked at it from the beginning of the design process? And in some sense, that's really what's happening with the Create-a-thon. So I was part of the first Create-a-thon and um, I, had an, I had the interesting opportunity that I was teaching a graduate class at the same time on creativity. So my students conducted 24-hour observations of the Create-a-thon. So they stayed up with all the students, um, take, you know, doing observations and really looking at how they were using the tools, how they were collaborating, where they were um, encountering conflict, which teams were more creative. Um, and in general, uh, what they found was that the more interdisciplinary teams and the more diverse teams had the most creative solutions. So then this leads me to uh, a new initiative at CSU. So we had the opportunity to think about what if we designed a place for creativity and design thinking. And with the generous gift from uh, the Richardson family and Nancy Richardson spearheading the project, we had the opportunity to spend 62 visioning sessions thinking about that question. Um, so it involved 90 different faculty, staff, students, alumni, industry, community partners, et cetera. And we came up with a building and experiences and curriculum all designed together. So the spaces that uh, we envisioned were driven by the creative process and driven by the experiences that we wanted students to have. And that is now under uh, construction. It's the Nancy Richardson Design Center. 
And uh, if you dro drive by the new stadium, you'll see it under construction right next to the stadium across Meridian from the stadium. And so the concept behind this, and I'm borrowing from IDEO's uh, design thinking uh, model here, is this is a place that we would like to have interdisciplinary teams come together, iterate through the design process, and use space as a resource. So within the building, um, we will have virtual reality, of course. So we will have the first open VR teaching lab on campus, so 50 stations, all VR with a VR headset. We'll have a VR uh, laptop cart available for checkout, so about 20 units that a whole classroom can use. And then we also have an ideation lab that will have the HTC Vive, so it'll be set up as room scale VR. And then we're looking at that in combination with other low tech and high tech technology. So we'll have our typical maker space with fabrication tools for t woods, metals, laser cutters, pr uh, 3D printers, et cetera. And then reconfigurable spaces for critique, exhibition, and classrooms. And we really see this as a living laboratory. So we're actually going to be studying the learning process, collaboration, communication, et cetera. And then along with that, we're uh, rolling out a new interdisciplinary certificate in design thinking. And so this is open to students from across campus. And what's interesting about this is the, the toolbox courses, which are one, possibly two credit classes. We see this as sort of a just-in-time approach to learning that are more hands-on, applied skill-based. So the technologies that students will be learning will be changing um, based on their demand, based on new, um, new technologies coming out, et cetera. And then culminating in kind of a project-based studio type experience. So a couple of quick images of the building. So this is the site plan, and it was intentionally laid out to take advantage of natural, natural paths that were already existing. On that site, it was a parking lot, and so the building is at an angle, and it's organized. It's actually split on the ground floor by Inspiration Alley. And then this is the first floor plan. So the computer, uh, the VR computer lab is G, and the ideation lab is F, and then the maker spaces are A, B, and D. So here's a little rendering. And I'm sorry, I don't have this in VR. I feel like I should have it in VR for you all, but I don't because we're still basically doing things in two dimensions. So here's a, a view of the hallway outside the maker space. Um, those maker spaces, so there's a lot of visual connectivity and they actually open up to the outside. Here's the ideation lab, so a real showcase space for VR. The ideation lab is not going to have any classes scheduled in it, so it'll be open for groups to reserve. Um, the exhibition critique area, again, all very flexible spaces, and the typical classroom, a lot of, everything's on wheels. Even the equipment that we can put on wheels is on wheels. So then what does design, or what does VR look like when you think about the whole design thinking process? And so these are just some ideas. Um, you know, what if students could change their perceptions of their body before they did a project? What if they could experience firsthand dementia, low vision, anxiety disorders, or other disabilities? How about navigating space and time? So changing your perspective. I mean, I think that really is the value of VR, that it allows students to become someone that they're not and experience the world virtually in a way that they wouldn't otherwise be able to do. And I think that's also core to this idea of problem finding or problem defining. So again, the beauty of virtual reality is you don't have to be a person, right? You could be a part of the solar system, right? Or you can navigate the bloodstream or you can manipulate molecules. And uh, two years ago at our inaugural uh, symposium, Kenny Grushala talked about that very thing. So he had, he was using a cave with, in this case, but um, he had three research teams uh, who had been working together for a number of years come into virtual reality for 90 minutes each. And every team came away with a new discovery something that they hadn't been able to perceive on the computer screen. So it wasn't until they were actually immersed, literally, in their data that they found new opportunities. 
So ideating options and prototyping solutions. So we often think about these as being kind of separate, but in the real world, they're really tangled up, right? I mean, if you're designing something, you're not saying, I'm going to ideate, and now I'm going to look at what I'm ideating, and then I'm going to ideate again. It's very much a back and forth process. But again, in, in, in some areas, it's hard to do that because we don't get feedback from use, not really. We get feedback from models or we get feedback from simulations. And so I think VR gets us a step closer to feedback from use. Um, and again, this is a, you know, I think this is IKEA again, go, go IKEA. But they, you know, have a really simple augmented reality app whereby you can shop for furniture, hold up your iPad, get a, see your room, and plop the furniture in. Um, so you're looking through your device with the camera to your room. Um, you know, as your dog gets in the way, he's now underneath your piece of furniture. Um, and then uh, looking at plugins. And so we've been using um, Enscape with our students um, this last semester. And what that allows them to do is as they're drawing or creating a 3D model, they can in real time see what that looks like in VR. So they're still having to sort of stop and put the headset on but it's a lot more fluid than having to output to another application or another device. But where we really wanna go, right, is being able to collaboratively design in virtual reality. And so this is Tilt Brush, and you know, it's amazing what people can do with a simple tool. In this case, you know, thinking about designing garments. And so, what we're really interested in is, is in trying to think about how virtual reality might enhance that process of exploration and feedback, how it can make that feedback more salient to students, more immediate, that they're able to perceive it more easily. And then ultimately, as we go back to the last stages, what we really want to do is see if VR can actually make it easier to collaborate between disciplines. So how can we bring in the medical professional, professionals, the designers, and the scientists together in a virtual environment to design a better healthcare system? Thank you. <laughs>